Welcome to the Homegrown at Home concert series for 2022. I'm Stephen Winnick, um, and for many years here at the American Folklife Center at the Library of Congress, we presented the Homegrown concert series featuring the best in folk music and dance from around the country and around the world. Now, normally we hold live concerts in Washington, D.C. at the Library of Congress, but in the year 2020, because of the global pandemic, we shifted to producing an online video concert series, which we call Homegrown at Home. And in that series, artists in whatever configuration they can safely play in record a video concert and submit it to us for the series. So now it's 2022. This is our third year of Homegrown at Home concerts because we're still being cautious about bringing audiences together at the library. So we are very happy to have the group were in our series this year. A few of us on the AFC staff first saw were perform at the Folk Alliance International Conference in 2016, and we've been eager to present them ever since then. But first, we were waiting for you to tour the US again, and then we had this global pandemic. So finally, we're presenting were virtually. Now, along with the Homegrown at Home concerts, we like to present interviews about the groups and their traditions. So I am here with the members of WUR, Bert, Peter, and Fabio. And one challenge I have in doing these interviews is pronouncing the names of bands and people from a wide variety of cultures. So I would love it if you would each um, say your name and then one of you maybe introduce the band. So welcome to the members of WUR. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Bert I'm... and I'm the accordion player. My, my name is Bert Rendig. Uh, I'm, I'm Fabio, Fabio Di Meo. I play the baritone saxophone. I, I, I guess my name is more easier to pronounce as there are a lot of Italian Americans uh, there. So. <laughs> and uh, my name is a double name. It's Peter Jan, actually. So it's Peter John, Peter mm -hmm. Jan or PJ, if you like. Uh, and I'm the bagpipe player and saxophonist uh, of uh, Look. All right, and and if one of you could explain the the basic idea behind the band were that you're in, <laughs> I know that's a big one, right? <laughs> We're just looking at each other to see who's going to speak. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you go ahead, Fabio. You do it on stage. Well, um, yes, I I also do the presenting on stage, so I will probably speak the most here as well. Um, <laughs> Well, what we do it's it's very easy. Um, so we just take uh, music from uh, from mostly from Kurilin uh, manuscripts, uh, the bell towers in Belgium, and uh, we we just take the melodies and we arrange uh, around those melodies all those tunes that we play. And um, um, we just came with that idea. Uh, our first CD was called "Back to the 1780s" instead of "Back to the 80s," uh, because the music is from the 18th century. And so um, our, 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 our input was like the bell tower was the radio of its time. You, you, when the bell tower was played in the city, it was the music. Everybody could hear it. And so it was like the radio. They would play tunes that were uh, uh, popular back then. And so we'd just take them back in the 21st century and modernize it a little bit to this century. That's mm -hmm. our global take on our music. <laughs> Thank you. Um, now, um, where is a group from Belgium? So um, talk a little bit about your country and maybe the traditional music uh, of, of Belgium. Well, Belgium, in fact, is uh, consists about uh, from it has two language groups and uh, the Dutch speaking part in the north, which we call Flanders and the French speaking part in the south, which uh, is called Wallonia. Um, we uh, we some of us were taking part in an, uh, in a musical exchange about 10 years ago and there was the question came play something from your region and we found out that we had some common repertoire but not a lot so that was actually a bit uh, the reason why we asked ourselves the question what can be found here because there was no living tradition anymore and then we we found those manuscripts with mainly carolyn uh, repertoire um, and PJ also plays uh, the, the bagpipes, the Flemish bagpipes or Brugel bagpipes. He will probably explain a bit later uh, about it. Um, so we, yeah, we were curious to find repertoire from our region. And uh, later on, we also discovered that, yeah, what is now our region was the music traveled way far further. So what we call now 
Flemish music or, or Belgian music is actually can also be found in, in over the border in Germany and the Netherlands, even in the UK. Um, but that's that was a bit the reason why we we wanted to dig into it was a bit looking for our roots. And then on the other hand, meanwhile, also not trying to give a historical correct interpretation of that music because we can it's kind of a guess but we wanted to reinterpret it with the with our, our ears of today um with all the influences we heard uh in, in, our, in our music allocation but even so on 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 popular music and radio today and the, the bands we like so that's a bit our story uh combining those two mm -hmm. thank you um so uh you know we've you you mentioned that your region is called uh flanders and that people there speak dutch and i think uh it one of the things that i noticed that you maybe you can respond to is i've been to belgium a number of times over the years once when i was a kid i was maybe 10 years old the first time i went to belgium and what i remember then is that people didn't describe their language as dutch they said that it was flemish but it wasn't as common to use the word dutch but now when I go to Belgium, like everybody just says, we speak Dutch. Is that has there been a change in terms of the the way people speak about the Flemish language and Flemish traditions? Well, yeah, but that that's a political issue. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it has it has political meaning. Like, um, like 30, 40 years ago, when you said I speak Flemish, there was no political connotation to it. You you would just speak Flemish like you would say I speak American instead of I speak English because it's not 100% the same as English uh, from the UK. So we say we speak Flemish because Dutch is also from the Netherlands, but it mm -hmm. sounds a little different. But now if you say things like I speak Flemish, uh, a lot of people, uh, some people take it as a political issue because we are... Every country has these problems now where you have the, the far right wings uh, who are coming up who want like the independence of Flanders. So they point everything out. This is Flemish. So if you use the word Flemish, sometimes it could be uh, interpreted as something political, which is actually not true. I mean, it is still Flemish, which, which we speak. But you say Dutch because it's more common to say Dutch. And also people abroad know Dutch. They know it's a language, but Flemish doesn't really uh, uh they don't know it they don't know what it is flemish they don't know flanders they know belgium but they don't know flanders so you say dutch just to be easy for everybody we speak dutch well, officially well, dutch is sense. correct of course that's the official it's name language it's, yeah it's a strong dialect uh so people from the netherlands hear that we are from flanders but we can understand each other uh, mm -hmm. it's like I you would say in america itself un ununderstandable also yeah if, if we, do, if we really go for it. It's like if you would say in America, I speak New York or I speak uh, <laughs> Seattle or I speak San Franciscan or something. It's like, yeah, okay, it's English, but with an accent. Right. And some words are maybe different. Yeah. Makes sense. Thank you. So um, you had mentioned that uh, the, the tradition isn't so much a living tradition. That is, there isn't, you know, that, that much traditional folk music remaining. But I recall maybe 20 years ago, there was, already a healthy revival going on groups like Cadrille and things like that. So were you influenced by that scene by, by other uh, Belgian folk groups that were around? Yeah, obviously. So uh, we don't have a link tradition, but the, it's only a short period that there is no, not tradition in Belgium. It's actually before, you know, between uh, the two world wars, it's ended. Uh, our, um, Traditional music went to a brass band music, actually, and we're strongly mm -hmm. influenced by uh, American music afterwards, too. So, but there we lost the connection with the repertoire that was originally played in our region. <clears throat> uh, but already in the uh, 50s, they, uh, they started the first revival. And actually, there are like three waves in the revival that the first revival was only uh, some, um, some people traveling around on a horse, uh, uh, going to record on the countryside, the old people that still remembered the nice mem melodies or songs, uh, maybe sang by their uh, fathers or mothers. Um, and then after this, there was already a revival also with looking to uh, uh, scores and uh, remaining um, uh, sources. Uh, and then you have the, the real folk, uh, folk and folk rock revival where you talk about, I guess, uh, mm -hmm. with uh, bands as uh, Cabril, um presenting also abroad of belgium more more and more um and of course we are influenced by by uh, 
bands, for example, like Ascard de Mille or Ambrosen, maybe as you know, uh, and mm -hmm. maybe you know. But yeah. A bit later, uh, you have a, a band called Hughes. It was only a, a duo. It was his uh, on the road, on the electric, so uh, uh, cozy, sitting, uh, playing music without electricity. So it was like a very, very cozy and, and nice music. And I, I think those bands are bands uh, that strongly influenced uh, us. But at the same time, um, uh, almost every Belgian band is strongly influenced by uh, bands from abroad. And also that influence uh, we have in our music, I guess, and uh, like uh, from Scandinavian uh, influences or Celtic influences too. Great. And you mentioned, you know, the brass band influence in American music. And of course, you see that in were with saxophones. So uh, so explain how you decided or it, you came to incorporate um, brass instruments into the the uh, traditional music that you're playing in the group. Well, the saxophone is a, is a Belgian invention. So that, yeah. <laughs> that, was, that was maybe more a coincidence than a choice, I think. <laughs> Um, yep, yeah, I think PJ is the best place to no, uh, answer yeah. the question. Yeah. When, when we started off, uh, we were like thinking about the sound we would uh, like to have. And uh, one of the first things we said, like, let's try something without percussion. Uh, nothing against percussion or percussionists <laughs> at <laughs> all. Uh, but uh, to, uh, so, and then we said, like, we, we, have, we have had a violin, guitar, uh, accordion, and I, bagpipes and saxophone and we would think like we need something low but not too low because actually the bases of the accordion are are the lowest in in this setting uh but something uh, low with a punch and i was studying at the same place where fabio was uh, studying uh music and um so i asked fabio uh, if he uh was uh, into some folk music and to play uh with us and so he said uh, yes and and the there we create uh, a bit this uh, combination of bagpipes or saxophones with uh, more common accordion, guitar, and uh, violin. And Great. And you mentioned that you were studying music uh, in the same place as Fabio. So talk a little about the training that the different members of the band have in music. Well, um, we all went to music school uh, as as children, as teenagers, and then afterwards, four of us uh, uh, went on to study at the conservatory. Uh, so we studied music. We majored in music. We have our master's degree in music, mm -hmm. except for Bert. Bert uh, studied something else, um, <laughs> but he's still a quite good musician. You don't need to study music to be a good musician. Right. Uh, <laughs> some people are just good and don't need to go study. Uh, but so yeah, we. That's actually also an influence you can hear in our music that we. Um, we play freely, but we also have this this educational background, which allows us to think a little further in our arrangements and and to make like concert music um, that is a little bit more interesting to listen to than just playing tunes from A to Z and just go straight ahead. And that makes our music a little bit agreeable uh, uh, agreeable to to hear for people who are not really into folk music. Uh, because I can understand people who are not into folk music say it's always just a tune and just playing, 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 and which is fun. I like it when you're at the festival, just having fun. But I can understand when you go to a concert after three songs, you're like, uh, again with the boom, 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 boom. Uh, so our, our music has, has a lot of layers, and these layers just came about with with the, with the education we had of, of listening to music and of arranging music that kind of way, um, which makes that we use each instrument for its capability, which he can do. Um, it's not just everybody plays the melody and the guitar plays some chords. No, it's like you can do this with your instrument. You can do this. And the education gave us to, made us able to, to discover our instruments from all the aspects we can do. And so we can, and even now, if we do new tunes, we discover new uh, uh, ways to play on our instruments. Oh, this is cool. We can do this as well. And that education just made it that we can, we know our instrument that well, that we can know, and also what we can do with the instruments. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of things you can do, but that you're not good enough to do. So you know where to stop and you know, I'm not going to do this because it's going to suck on stage, but <laughs> I have a different way to do it. 
So yeah, Maybe. I think also that the, the personalities a bit and the in, musical interest of each member band member is pretty distinct in a way. I mean, we all like folk music and tunes. That's of course how we met each other. But like uh, Jeroen, our, our fiddle player, uh, studied jazz violin and really likes also to listen to it and uh, and and imp improvisations and so on. While I think Peter Jan and Jonas are are also formed and 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 active as in baroque music also mm -hmm. uh fabio is, is, is it works for the royal concert hall and and is also knows a lot about jazz music but also classical music and uh yeah i uh, i did a lot of, I, I i listened to a lot of folk music and of course the the collection of all those influences and ideas you know, you know the music you listen to the bands you like and also for uh, formation of course uh yeah highly influences an, an arrangement but Peter Jan is the one who who makes uh, more than ninety percent of the arrangement. So we mm -hmm. often start from his his idea, and then everybody uh, interprets according to their taste and 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 capabilities, of course. Well, Peter Jan, if you could say a little then about how you come up with an arrangement. I mean, what's your process for for taking a tune and making it into a a were presentation? Yeah. It, it depends how much time I have. <laughs> Sometimes <laughs> it's not a lot, but most of the times, it, like it starts with uh, taking one of the books of the period because we were with several manuscripts actually of the 18th century, um, and then it starts with just reading. Most of the time, it's in the night when it's quiet at home and just playing a bit on a piano or, or so, and just looking for good tunes. And uh, the strange thing is that. Maybe I have read those books already 20 times and every time there is different melodies coming up. So it's also the, the maybe taste of the moment. Uh, and then most of the times I just s select some tunes and just play a bit around, but not more than that. And then uh, the tunes that get in my head, like they, they turn around. And then uh, one moment I start, uh, uh, most, mostly it's at the piano and I start from, from a, a bass line or, a, or nice harmonies. Uh, to this melody and uh, well what you often have with folk music is that the melody is quite uh, how to say uh, um, it uh, it's very predictable what chord you should add to this melody mm -hmm. so uh, and uh, of course after a while the the the, the game is actually to avoid the the most common chords and to look for for different chords to to uh, color the melody in a different way and then it's uh, it depends on the melody it depends on the, the if it's a slow tune or a fast tune um that i or it's the melody that stays important and i i work around with like adding bridges and and uh, different chords or um it's more about the chords and this this the atmosphere and the melody is just one of the layers on on top of all all of this but that depends on on uh, on the, on the tune and then it's uh, as Beth said I, I do not write every score for each musician it's like the, the basic idea with, like that it has a, a proper length and uh, so it, it already has this build, the build up and I have an idea who, who can play what but that, that's just some notes on a score and then it goes to the band and when we start like we did last week a, a new tune like two new tunes uh, in, a, in a rehearsal and it's just uh, playing playing it through from the top to the end and then uh, everybody comes up with his own uh, own things special to his instrument uh, and, and his style of playing great yeah and it, you can really tell listening to were compared to a lot of other folk bands that you're thinking about not having the predictable chords you know <laughs> because so many groups do go with the obvious chords it doesn't there's nothing wrong with them and no, they, no, they no, make no. sense no. um but it's also kind of cool to hear a group that's you know suddenly doing chords that sound like jazz or they sound like a, a classical uh variations you know so it's kind of uh it's cool to hear your music for that reason that's one of the reasons that you really i think would appeal to people who who think about music uh, a, a little more than than um, sort of an, a, just a, a regular listener. So that's kind of musician's music in a way, which is really neat. So um, so thanks for putting all that work into those. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah. I guess another question, and this is sort of going back in your own lives, I guess, but how 
do young people in Belgium today get into folk music? How do you find it? How does it become part of your life? Well, I think nowadays you can study and some music schools offer it. So that's the way. Um, for me, it was through a venue in, uh, in my hometown. Um, there are some festivals. Uh, so that's often the way, unfortunately, you can hear uh, folk music on, through the radio, and that's also how people discover it. There are, there are some shows about it, but it's not the most common genre, uh, of course, on national radio. Uh, but these are, these are the ways, but it's, it stays kind of niche. There's a lot of effort put into to, uh, to break it open and give as much people access to it. And I also think it's, it's going upwards. Uh, um, but um, but the, yeah, of course, uh, not everyone. And if I would ask in my street, who knows how a, a, a Flemish bagpipe or a French bagpipe looks like, I think uh, not half will know. Uh, I will say so there's a, it's not the most common uh, genre. Yeah. But you, you need to find the right persons that know the scene a bit. And if you know the scene, there are quite much uh, opportunities to, to get in contact with it. We have a very lively uh, ball folk scene, for example, yeah. where a lot of uh, musicians, uh, for example, also we we played our first concerts, like not as a concert, but as a ball, ball folk mm -hmm. to entertain dancers. Uh, and it's a scene where you can perform the rest of your life, if you like. Uh, <laughs> And then the venue where Beth uh, talked about in his hometown, that was also the place where I discovered uh, folk music the most because it's a, a venue that invites a lot of international artists. And like this venue, it's called The Air. We have also a very big festival called Hoikoorts. Uh, we have some very good uh, traditional music uh, stages. So it's like workshop week mm -hmm. uh, in Wallonia and in Belgium, uh, in Flanders. So um, there are quite a lot of opportunities you have if you're really into folk music, um, but you have to find find them. You have to get in touch with somebody that that plays. Yeah. But I guess I guess it's the same with with a lot of styles of music, which are, are not pop or rock. It depends on your parents as well. I mean, if you have parents who are into that kind of music, well, the chances are big that you will also uh, come in contact with that music. And if they're not, uh, like my parents weren't not, it depends on your friends. Yeah. I mean, I had, I, I had friends who played in, in, in those bands. And um, uh, one of my friends played in a band also, uh, which is called Ido. And he always took me and said, yeah, come with me to Hoikots, which is a festival. It's very nice just to have fun. And so you come in contact with all those people and with that music. And that's, if, yeah, you know a guy who knows a guy. I mean, how, how do you come to play classical music? It's easier because you go to music school and you, you learn music. But why do you go to music school? Because your parents made you? Because you're interested? Because a friend of you plays piano and you want to play piano as well? So it, it actually also, where did you grow up? How did you grow up? Uh, in which neighborhoods? Did, did you have a lot of access to music? Did you... Did, did you didn't you have access to music? It has a lot of. I mean, why do you play guitar and don't you play and you don't play saxophone or why do you play <laughs> violin and and you don't play the harp? Um, it's, it's. I mean, if it depends. Teacher, on the anthem, of yeah. course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And this there are good... the, there are also the these festivals where you have the popular like pop pop or rock bands with influences from. Uh, with, from folk music and on those festivals some, some, sometimes you have folk bands next to pop uh, bands and there some people discover also the the more uh, uh, folky way of playing and not more the, the poppy way of, uh, of performing yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah we have the Dranuter festival which yeah, is the first yeah. weekend of August and that I think for a lot of people uh, ma uh, made them discover um, folk music it's a, it's it's a bigger festival which attracts a lot of people, and where is also folk music, next to uh, next to pop, pop, pop yeah. music and rock or, or or similar. It's all genres around also traditional music. There, and what it? is folk music? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so this Flemish dance music tradition that you that you play in or, or pl use as part of your repertoire, um, I know we and you're. In the concert, you talk a lot about the carillon, and we'll talk about that in a second too. But but 
beyond, you know, before that and beyond that, there's a, a larger sort of tradition of, of Flemish dance music and, and dance music across Europe. So how does that survive now for you to access? I know you use manuscripts a lot. You must have had other players that you listen to. How, how did you, um, how do you find tunes basically? Well, the, the books are actually, uh, or they're in private collection or they're in libraries. Uh, mm -hmm. But actually, I think me, uh, all the books now, we have them digitally. So everybody of work has uh, the PDFs. And if somebody likes it, you can always uh, send us an email and we, we're happy to share. Um, uh, so that's work done by, by other people to digitalize uh, this music. And it's a very specific uh, uh, moment in, in a period in, in music uh, style. Um, so it's sometimes it, there is a connotation to dance music, but it's more like in the Baroque way of the right, it's a bouge or it's a, a paran or it's a chacon, it's a, a almond. Yeah. It, it's all those types you, you find also in, in uh, Baroque music uh, uh, scores, for example. Um, and then, of course, you have uh, in Belgium, but I, I guess you all know, but Belgium is very small if you compare to, to America. So we're, we're really the crossroad of Europe where all types of dances and tunes and sort of music uh, travels uh, through uh, Belgium and maybe some uh, musicians picked up some nice tunes from Belgium and a lot of Belgian musicians probably picked up some nice melodies from other uh, regions uh, around uh, Belgium, and it, it's the same with dances because you you can see the Polonaise uh, that was a, a dance from uh, uh, Poland, for example, became very popular. The waltz became very popular, and all those dances are still danced today. Uh, but also the same; it's not anymore as the historical way of dancing. It's not like with all those different figures; it, it has changed a lot. Uh, and I, I think, I, I guess it's a good thing to, to have it uh, as a living thing and not as a, a museum uh, thing, because also that still exists. It, we, we don't call it uh, folk then, but folks music or uh, folk is dance, like uh, dances of the people. Uh, mm -hmm. And there they try to have the, the figures and all the uh, dances right as it uh, used to be, uh, like maybe 50 years, maybe 100 years, maybe 150 years ago. Mm -hmm. And there's also one of the biggest uh, dance festivals, folk dance festivals. I, one, a very big folk dance festival is also happening in Belgium. Uh, it's Bommel Festival. And that, that meant a lot for, for bands for starting musicians, as PJ already uh, said, uh, to to get yeah, experience and, and and gives a lot of occasion to play uh, for dancers and dance music. So, so, um, so this tradition existed, um, as you say, both um, in uh, in folk tradition and in the work of composers. And you have these uh, wonderful manuscripts that you work with uh, to access this music. So um, one of the things we always um, appreciate because we are the Library of Congress is the fact that people use these resources, library and archive resources. So could you say a little bit about what kind of resources there are in Belgium for finding this music, uh, the, these archival versions of the music? I think there are there are song for over times so a period of time there are several sources we use manuscripts often city manuscripts or uh, for example also the booklet of Ambello is a booklet that uh, fell behind the organ uh, of a church in the yeah on the the the, the year on the book says 1746 mm -hmm. and the, the the organ was restored in the 70s in 1970s uh, and when they took away the pipes, they found that that booklet. Wow. Um, but they also done, uh, as PJ said, uh, in the sixties, a lot of field recordings have been done, and, and music has been written down. There are the song books, of course, and then yeah, then it it depends a bit when when you from when from when you want to start counting because from the fourteen hundreds you have the the Grutthusen manuscript or the Antwerp's lit book uh, that's fifteen hundred and a bit. So. Yeah, there are a lot of resources, and we chose the eight, like the 1700s, as a period because uh, I think also um, 
PJ and Jonas have a training in, in, in Baroque music, and it's a, it's a period of time where where that distinction is between between traditional music and uh, I, there is a lot of influence, uh, Baroque influence and and, uh, uh, and and traditional music, and that we thought was interesting. Yeah, and it's also this 1780s comes actually from a book from Leuven. I, I used to live next to a church where there was a, a big uh, Carolin in Leuven, and the book from Franz de Prince. Uh, was found in that church, like he was the bell tower musician and organ player in, in that church uh, in Leuven. And that was 1780 on the score. So there came the idea actually back to the 1780s. Uh, from. But it's a bit like, I guess, with you, we find them uh, in personal collections. And then some of it, the work, for example, is done by uh, Hubert Bohne, who was uh, involved with the uh, Music Instrumental Museum of Brussels. Uh, but he did a lot of work to make uh, a lot of scores, for example, of the music. But it's a lot of uh, this brass band or uh, uh, fanfare music, we say in Dutch. Uh, and then um, you also have now nowadays, for example, there is in Wallonia a new project that started. Uh, it's Project Melchior. And they start now to uh, digitalize and to write down all uh, field recordings and so. And for example, for Wallonia, I have another uh, person. Uh, it's Olivier Vienne, uh, who um, also wrote down all the tunes from the 18th century and 19th century of Wallonia. Uh, for example, uh, Hermann de Witt is a, a musician, also a bagpipe player, uh, and an old player because he plays a lot of instruments and he's uh, very good in making uh, uh, instruments from uh, rubbish, actually. That's one of the uh, projects. Yeah. But it, his uh, band was called Klitschke, and with Klitschke, they have recorded. I don't know, maybe 25 albums or so. And from each period of time, they recorded almost everything they kept, could find, I guess. So uh, that's a big uh, resource too. So, uh, well, there are quite quite a lot of resources. That's why actually we also limited ourselves to this this uh, period. And also the music still sounds a bit like, uh, it sounds together still. Yeah, it holds into one. It sort of yeah. It it you can identify it as as a, a thing. Yeah, that's very interesting. So um, so you mentioned you we've mentioned the the bagpipes a number of times, and uh, I guess it's sort of a, a, a something that's iconic of Flemish culture in a way because you mentioned them as the the Bruegel bagpipes. So talk a little bit about your pipes because that's an interesting instrument. I guess it's, it'll be me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So the, the pipes I play, it's, uh, the, we call them the Bruegel pipes. Some say it's the Flemish pipes. And yeah. it's, uh, it's uh, actually a bagpipe that's found on the paintings of Bruegel. And he worked between Amsterdam and uh, Belgium. So uh, Brussels, so it's a bagpipe of the lowlands, we can say too. Because uh, for uh, those who would like to know more about bagpipe history, there are more than 140 different types of pipes. Uh, everybody knows the loudest. Uh, and, uh, but there are a lot of different pipes. Uh, we say in Europe, every region has its own bagpipe. In France, for example, they have 27 or so different sort of pipes. In Belgium, we only have three uh, pipes that we still know of. Um, and uh, actually, the, the pipes I play, it's a reconstruction after the paintings, and there is one instrument found in the museum in uh, Wallonia, uh, in Wien, uh, Wien, like uh, Wien? Vienna. 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 Yeah. Um, and it's uh, with the folk revival, uh, first in Belgium, they adapted Scottish pipes, uh, made it look like uh, the Bruegel pipes, and then they, uh, uh, people like uh, Jean-Pierre Van Hees, uh, Rémi Dubois, uh, for example, and also in France, Bernard Blanc and other uh, bagpipe uh, builders start to do a lot of work, uh, research work. And they found also these instruments, for example, in Vienna uh, and made, made the bagpipe sounds again. But it's a reconstruction. Again, there is not, not an instrument left over from the six, 16th century bagpipes. Uh, but the sound is common to the central France bagpipe. The, there are back, bagpipes like this in uh, Germany and in, in uh, England too, mm -hmm. that have a, the same color uh, of sound. And to compare it, uh, the, you have the Scottish one that's the loudest. Uh, I play also the Baroque Bizet, which is a chamber music instrument, the Baroque pipes from France. Uh, that is a soft one. Um, the Galician is a, a bit louder than ours. 
so uh, and then you have because our bagpipe is with double reeds like an hobo or a, a bassoon mm -hmm. um, and then you have bagpipes with a, a single reed uh, more like the saxophones or clarinets mm -hmm. uh, but they have a totally different sounds and you, you find those instruments more in the in the east of europe for example yeah yeah. So one thing that I notice um, seeing you play the pipes, or well, a couple of things we might as well mention. Um, there's, it's a bellows blown bagpipe. Is that right? I think. Well, not traditionally. I see. Okay. <laughs> no. On the paintings of Bruegel, they're all blowing with loud. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, but yours has a bellows. Yeah. It's an adaption I made because I played this Baroque Musette, uh, and that's always with the bellows. And you have different other types like the the Alien pipes, for example, or, or the Northern and small pipes or with bellows. Uh, and my backpipe uh, builder is building, uh, building and this uh, Baroque Musat and the backpipes, uh, the Flemish backpipes. And so I adapted those uh, all to the bellows. It, it, it began as a, an ear problem. I couldn't blow for a period and then oh, I, see. I never went back to the <laughs> Mount Blown instrument. There are some, some advantages here. Uh, yeah. With bellows, uh, yeah. Well, another thing that I noticed is when you're fingering it, is there a, a one drone that's set into the common stock with the chanter, but then another drone on your shoulder? Yeah. Well, I played two different ones. There is one with two drone, drones in the front. That's the well, real um, uh, Bruegel pipes. And then the other one is an adaption. It's like more the central French one where there is the little drone which gives this the same note as the tonic note of the the chanter mm -hmm. um, that is next to the chant chanter, and then the other one is going to the shoulder or also in the front. If, uh, it's a choice. Uh, Very interesting. So thank you. Um, so uh, so we have talked about the the bagpipes, but there's other instruments in the group, of course. And and someone mentioned that the saxophone is a Belgian invention. So let's talk about the saxophone as well in the group and maybe fabio could talk about it okay instrument. let's make the discussion interesting um so <laughs> the, sa <laughs> the saxophone one of the most beautiful instruments there is uh, it one is a belgian them. invention but it was created uh, uh it was like created it was made uh popular in france actually so it was invented by adolf sax uh, who lived in dinant which is a actually the world's smallest city, I think, in Dinant. <laughs> it's, it's a fact. Uh, it's very beautiful if you want to visit it. Uh, it's there's saxophones everywhere. Um, so he patented it, this ID in 1830, something like this, uh, early 1800s. And um, it actually, actually, he came on the ID to put uh, a reed on a, on a brass instrument. So he started... His main idea was he, he worked with uh, brass instruments first, the sax horns, which we still know as, as uh, instruments like the euphonium or the, the baritone, which is called. Those are sax horns. And his idea was to make um, the, 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 yeah, the, the, the sound uh, projection towards the public. So a lot mm -hmm. of instruments, their sound projection, like the violin is here. You yeah. play it here. So... If you're over there, you hear it differently. And so he made his, his uh, like the clarinet, you play it down, uh, but the trumpet, you play it in front. And so he wanted to make more instruments like this. So that's why the saxophone you see is bellow, is always directed to the public, except the soprano, but that's a different story. Yeah. So he came on the idea to use, um, to use a fingering system of uh, woodwinds on brass instruments. So that's where it all starts. So he created the Uffikleide, which is this big weird instrument you can find it on the internet Uffikleide, and uh, it's uh, it's actually a woodwind type instrument played uh, with a mouthpiece of a brass instrument. It's not that great. It mm. didn't have a. It wasn't that success. It still exists, but it wasn't that successful. So then he said, "I'm going to put a reed on it," and so actually he came to invent the saxophone. Actually, the first model was the baritone saxophone, and um, which I play. And then it started out in France. They used it to replace the clarinets uh, when it was bad weather for the marching bands. So uh, actually in the military, they start using it because wood is fragile. It's very difficult to mend uh, when you have problems. So they said, oh, the saxophone is actually a brass clarinet. That was the idea. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's actually historically, it's what happens. A lot of people say, a lot of people learn to play the saxophone like a clarinet. 
which is disgusting. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 so the, at the beginning, the saxophone was really learned by clarinet players because the fingering is similar, the, the type of blowing is similar. Um, and so the sound of the saxophone was actually uh, the, the, the sound that everybody, that most people like, was created by jazz musicians. Mm -hmm. uh, because before that, classical musicians were often clarinet players playing the saxophone as well. So they didn't play the saxophone with the intention of playing saxophone, but just playing an instrument which is similar to the clarinet. And uh, it had a good, good, a very good, uh, great ev evolution on the saxophone. And you had, uh, it, actually, America has, has a lot, a lot, a lot of artists uh, which made the saxophone uh, work, not, not only jazz, but also classical in the 1900s, early 1900s. A lot of American uh, uh, music uh, musicians played the saxophone classically and made it uh, a little better than what I made it known to go into orchestras and a solo instrument. But then the jazz came and uh, the difference between the sound is mainly the way you play it, whereas the classical musician plays it like a clarinet, which you put your your underlip on your teeth and you, you bite down on your instrument. Whereas jazz, uh, I'm not going to teach you how jazz uh, existed because it's an American thing, but <laughs> I'm just going to say some things. Uh, where the jazz musicians started to play instruments, they didn't really go to music school. They just like, here's a trumpet, play on it. So they just blow on a trumpet. Oh, there's a sound coming out. I'm going with it. It is the same with the saxophone. When you see a saxophone player jazz playing on, it just blows on it. It, it doesn't have like this. There wasn't a teacher that you have to put your lip here and you have to put your cheeks like this. And it, could, it was just, it's a totally different sound, which actually makes the jazz sound. And that makes that, that instrument so, on terms of sound, so, so wide. There's so many ways to play that, that instrument. And you, mm -hmm. can, you can play it loud, you can play it soft, you can play it very classical, you can play it very, very ugly, which is also a type of sound people like. And it's Belgian. It's one of the good things of Belgium, like waffles <laughs> and fries. <laughs> and uh, right. Except that those waffles and fries in America are... You kind of made it worse, but with the saxophone, <laughs> with the saxophone, you made you made some good things with it. So that's, that's why I thought of it. That's a good point. Yeah. So no, it's true because people think about you know the the saxophone and the first thing they think of is jazz, so they have this American impression. Uh, but it yeah, but it's very interesting the, the history of the instrument. But a, another thing that's kind of interesting about that is that you know in most forms of folk music what we call folk music the folk music scene people don't use the saxophone very much and uh, it might be because it's so associated with jazz in people's minds but um but it's interesting that you as a band have embraced the saxophone uh that much so what what do you think about that in terms of why it might be that it's not that common in folk music well it is when a lot of bands start like you said how do you come in contact with folk music well, often you come in contact with folk music, uh, festivals, uh, ball folk, and those musicians, of course, play mostly the traditional instruments you yeah. see in folk. So it's, a, it, it's an evolution that's starting. You see more and more people playing the saxophone in traditional music. Um, I think also that, but not only the saxophone, people started doing it because it's, uh, it's, it's an, uh, you can play every key on it. Yeah. If you play the Irish flute, it's yeah. okay. These are the keys. If you play the bagpipes, these are the keys. If you play another key, I have to take another bagpipe or I have to take another instrument. But so people started using like the normal, the, 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 the classical flute because you can play all the keys or the soprano saxophone because you can play all the keys and which makes it very easy to play a lot of things. And so yeah. I, you can see an evolution of more and more bands play saxophone or brass instruments into the folk music. And I think it, it has to do that you come more people come in contact with folk music now than before. So you, you will have more variety of musicians who play different instruments who say, I want to play folk music. Yeah. And uh, yeah, but you play the electric guitar. Yeah, but why can I do it? And so you have sure. rock folk music, folk <laughs> rock coming out of, I play the drums. It's not a folk instrument, but yeah, it can be cool. Yeah. And so it, it just needs time to adapt and to, to come into the scene. And then, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, you mentioned 
playing in all the keys. And uh, so I play in a group, I sing in a group that has uh, an accordion player and she plays both button accordion, which, you know, she can only play in a couple of keys. It's a melodeon, but she also plays piano accordion. So Bert, talk about uh, accordions and that <laughs> issue of the, the keys and how you get into uh, the different tunes with your accordion. Yeah, and the, the uh, accordions are, are, not, are not really standardized. Huh? Uh, like most people know the, uh, the the four types of saxophones and then okay a bass saxophone and there will be some variations but let's say uh, uh, it, there's there's a standardization there and then of course with accordions uh, it's a pretty modern instrument and it, it, it I think it became very quick very popular and uh, what is a bit uh, amazing about it to me is that also uh, the diatonic accordions or, or accordions that were simpler uh, in, from the beginning are still popular. And mm -hmm. it's, it, it has something to do, I think, also with the, the push and pull of a melodion. Yeah. Uh, um, also uh, defines often the groove or the pace of a certain tune. So the tune really sounds better on, on that type of instrument while on a chromatic accordion and the, the classical ones, you know, those very heavy you can almost hide yourself behind it yeah. uh, uh, instruments they have all the possibilities uh, um, uh, but that doesn't mean that um, that that a certain tune uh, should sound worse on another type of instrument and then of course yeah the the whole range of uh, bandonians over concertinas you know, melodians diatonic chromatic piano keyboard button keyboard and then even like the type of instrument I play is a chromatic button accordion. Right. <laughs> uh, but but I have a very good friend here. His name is also Bert. He also plays the chromatic button accordion. Uh, but f f at, uh, we have, I have five rows and the C is on the first row and his C is on the third row. And you also have accordions with the C on the second row. So it means that uh, yeah, I can really play on his instrument, although it looks exactly the same. Uh, <laughs> so the fingering <laughs> is totally different. So it makes, it it makes the touring yeah. also uh, not the easy. Uh, it, it, it's when when my accordion breaks down, it will. It's not easy to find the same instrument. That's always my. That's my biggest stress. Yeah. Uh, the same with the bagpipes. I think when we lose, when we, when something happens to the bagpipes, um, yeah, he can whistle on stage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's. Uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, yeah. I, I like to be I, I, in wood. I see, I see, and I think we all see the accordion. But as the glue between, uh, that's also my my way of of playing that I really like, um, and and making contrast also. At uh, it goes the lowest sound is really low, goes under the baritone saxophone. I think the highest sound. I mean, the fiddle can technically go higher, probably, but mm -hmm. uh, yeah. but uh, <laughs> the highest in, in tune sound. No. no that's, <laughs> Uh, uh, but I mean, and, and playing with those contrasts is, is uh, also in, in terms of dynamics, uh, of course, the saxophones can do that too, but that's, uh, that's a bit how I see my role within, within the band. Yeah. yeah. Great. Thank you so much. Well, so there's one more instrument. I mean, you mentioned there's also, of course, uh, guitar and <clears throat> fiddle or violin, and there's mandolin in your group as well. <clears throat> but there's one instrument that's really important to your project about towers and the and the concert that you did for us and that is the carillon which is a very unusual instrument also not a not specifically a belgian invention but a dutch invention so it's interesting there too um but talk about the carillon a little bit well we're not carillon players but we will right. reproduce it as as good as possible it's a uh, we thought it was interesting to do to make an album and a concert program around that for i think uh, two reasons main reason it's uh, we found a lot of sources that were written down by carillon players they were yeah, professional musicians hired by the city uh, so in city archives and secondly it's also an instrument that really we can pinpoint at our region uh, let's say the low countries and then um also because of the wars became known also outside of western europe let's say um and it's uh we like uh, as i said in the beginning we like to interpret 
all tunes with and we always say like with our ears of today what what reaches our our ears as musicians but also just sounds that reaches and carolyn had a bit the same function huh? it it um the bell tower someone played on the bell tower and if you were near it you heard it anyway so it was very hmm. flexible it was not music for for the rich or for the ones who 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 went to church you know it was uh he and he, it was music that was really for the people and also a lot of um for a lot of occasions and non-religious occasions there, were, there was music made or written or played uh celebrations uh new mayor uh, a king that came to visit an organization that that and you can also see it on the titles an organization that existed 50 years and so on mm -hmm. so yeah that's that was something that that we thought there's a lot of how you say flesh around it you know yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's it was it was an instrument used to i mean what do you do now if you celebrate your independence day well you put music systems on you know, pa systems and you play but yeah, that didn't exist back then. So what did they do? You had marching bands or you had the Kurilan playing some tunes. Yeah. And so the whole city could like hear the king enter um, uh, City Hall and there was a march who was playing on the on the Kurilan. I, it's We're not historians on instruments, but you, you can say that this instrument was created. We need something loud for whole city to hear. And what is loud? Well, bells. And we need to put it very high so the whole yeah. city can can enjoy the music coming out of the of those clock towers and yeah also uh flanders or at least some cities in flanders um had uh were historically pretty had a lot of power during the the, the 1400s and 1500s the middle ages mm -hmm. yeah. again bruges and later on antwerp brussels um so it's also not a coincidence that of course that there are a lot of uh, of those instruments here and a lot of those uh towers so that's also a bit um I think the, the, because we did some research before we went to uh, we, we spoke to some Carolan players and went to saw some instrument and and that guy it was Luke Rombouts who is an authority about, mm -hmm. uh, in in Carolan playing and and the history of the instrument said it was the radio of the late Middle Ages uh, he said right so. and, but uh, yeah this, this instrument has a very typical sound but what I find very nice about this instrument is it still sounds how it sounded back then so the melodies we play if you have it sounded on a on a bell tower or on a carillon uh it still sounds now as people have heard it uh, back then and so it's again a bit this contrast between old and and new we call ourselves new We're, well it's still a bit old bagpipes and so but it's uh, well this this not a clash but like a comparison or or uh, like this link with with the past we like to to put down yeah, and it's nice that you included a real Carolyn and, and a player in your video. So I'll say that for our audience. If you're seeing this interview before you see the concert video, you can actually see a portable Carolyn, they might say, a smaller version of <laughs> norm. Yeah, right. It could be wheeled around maybe, but the, the normal version is in a big uh, constructed tower. So as you say, it was sort of a you had to be a powerful city. It was a it was a municipal project um, to build one of these uh, um, instruments. And uh, I will also say for our our normal home audience that we actually have a carillon here in Washington D.C., which was a gift from the Netherlands in the 1950s, and it's uh, it's near Arlington National Cemetery, so it's in actually in Virginia in Arlington. But if uh, people who are uh, fans of were and watching this video um, and are in the Washington, D.C. area, the National Park Service uh, curates a carillon over in Virginia, which you can go and see. So um, so the members of were were so uh, thankful to you for coming and um, and doing this interview with us. And so I always like to ask at the end whether there's there's anything that I didn't ask that you want to tell our audiences, an American audience in Washington about um about your instruments or your music or your tradition i think there's something i want to tell uh, that is that we're going to play in the us in november so if if someone would like to see us live they can see the dates on our website all right so november 2022 we're looking forward to seeing you here in the united states yes so once again, Peter, Jan, and Fabio, and Bert, 
thank you so much for being here with us uh, for this interview in the Homegrown at Home concert series. Yeah, thank you. It was thank a you. pleasure. Thank you.